All right, I think we're good. Sweet. Okay. What's up, guys? Welcome to Mr. Colicchio's last final uh, review session. This time we're on location. We are at Panera Bread because I'm in Durham and not at my house. So unfortunately, you do not get the view of my illustrious apartment. In fact, we are outside Panera, as you can tell. Panera. It's the only place that has good enough internet for me to be able to use it. So today you'll be seeing see me eating my illustrious meal of flatbread, bread, and macaroni and cheese. Isn't that lovely? Don't mind the random people walking behind me. I don't know who they are. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna start the video by doing um, just a couple pointers um, about taking an exam. First and foremost, um, the North Carolina final exam is super easy. Um, I don't want you guys to think that it has anything to do with the curve, um, but because I don't know if there is one or not, um, they don't tell us that information. And honestly, if, if I knew, I wouldn't tell you anyways, to be honest. And that's mainly for the fact that I don't want you guys not trying it for some reason. Now, for the record, I think that you guys are very prepared for this, especially my students. I can't speak for the other teachers, but my students, you guys are totally prepared for this. Um, going into it, uh, we've worked on two major strategies. Uh, we know that the North Carolina finals are mainly reading based, so we've been kind of looking at a lot of passages and working with primary sources. And one thing that I've done is kind of step, uh, created a four step process for uh, helping students gather information on how to solve problems that um, involve long passage readings. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show an example and kind of break it down uh, question by question, and then we'll get into the actual questions. So bear with me on that. The American one exam. I see that we have a lot of people in the Hangout already, and that's awesome. I'm really glad to see that's many people ready to be successful. 15 already, I think that's most of them we've ever had, ever. By the way, Panera's mac and cheese is dang, really good. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen so that we can break down the questions. So bear with me on that. Uh, let's go with, okay, here we go. As you guys can see, we have the released uh, test right now. Um, and with this, um, we see examples of former questions being used in the test. So the first thing I want us to do is when we're given a question that looks like this, where it's a lot of reading, I tell my kids step one is to just skip, don't look anything at the reading. Don't look at the reading. Look at the question. So step one, read the question. So in his farewell address, how did George Washington influence, excuse me, attempt to influence the foreign policy of the United States? Now, if you know anything about George Washington, you know in his farewell address, you should know three major things. One, he talks about neutrality. Number two, he talks about staying um, uh, term limits for presidents. And the third thing he talks about is really making sure that we don't get too uh, cocky because we're not, we're a brand new state. We can't just go around throwing our weight around. So just knowing that, we could probably answer the question and see that the answer is neutrality. However, for people who don't have that kind of remembering ability um, that we might like to have, what we do is we read the, we read the answers and we know, if, see if we can eliminate any, okay? Now, if we look at the answers, we see for instance, letter B. He encouraged politicians to promote a foreign policy of imperialism. Now, we haven't talked about this at all in class, and I understand that that's something that we need to make sure that we could just immediately rule out if that's the case. But once again, if you're somebody who doesn't you know, have this background knowledge, it's going to be really hard. So step one, read the question. Step two, oops. Step one, read the question. Step two, read and try to eliminate answers. Now the third step is the most critical one. You wanna be able to find the answer in the reading. And you do that by something I developed called Where's Waldo? And if you don't know who Waldo is, Waldo is a red and white striped shirt gentleman who looks like this. 
And it's, you might be wondering why I'm bringing up an image of Where's Waldo. And the reason is because the idea is sometimes reading an answer choice like this looks sort of similar to this. It looks really discombobulated and you can't really find the answer. Now, let me be clear. The answer is in the passage. That's the best part about the North Carolina Files. You could know nothing about history and do these questions and get them right because the answer is always in the passages. That's the greatest part about these tests. Now, where is that answer? Well, that's where we have to find out. So, what we do is we would go through each answer and we would try to see if we could find the answer in the passage. By finding Waldo, quote unquote, we can answer the question and you can highlight that part that proves it. So if we read through this paragraph, we can kind of rule out answer A's, B, and D, and we can find that he recommended a policy of neutrality to other nations simply by looking for either the word neutrality or something that has to do with neutrality, which means, of course, remaining from each other. And so if we look, you say the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations extending commercial relations. See, people might think that, oh, that might have that. But what happens is, if we want to have good commercial relations, we need to have with them as little connection as possible. Okay? Europe has a set of primary interests to which we have none on a very remote relation. Henceforth, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to other concerns. Hence, therefore, unwise to implicate ourselves by artificial ties and ordinary vicissitudes of our politics. So that in itself is really going at neutrality because he doesn't want us to get involved. He doesn't want an alliance. He doesn't want us to have commercial ties. He doesn't want us to imperialize. And that's what it really comes down to. You could do this for a lot of other primary source readings. For instance, sometimes the answer is directly in the question. If you look at number four, which is about Angela Grimke, you look at the question, how did Angela Grimke's religious beliefs affect her participation in the abolitionist movement? You know that the question's asking you about her religious beliefs about abolition. And you know abolition has to deal with freeing the slaves. So you're looking for answers that have to do with abolition. Answer A, that's abolition. Answer B, that's abolition. Answer C, that's abolition. Answer D, not abolition, so we can get rid of D. So now we're left with answers A, B, and C, and what we get is a 33% chance of getting this right without even having to read this. Knowing that, we go to the thing and it says, I appeal to you, my friends, as mothers. Are you willing to enslave your children? You can see right there that as she says, mothers, boom, it's literally right there. That's where Waldo is. He's easier to find than this one, which is great. Like I said, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, sorry that it's all discombobulated here. Okay, so, oh, now we're snapception right now. So we're back, and still at about 13 people. All right, so the good thing is that we kind of have for an understanding um, how to do that. The next step we're going to do is how to answer short answer questions, because we know we have to do 42 multiple choice questions. We also have to do two short answers. And those are super critical to being successful when it comes time to take the test, because if you can do all the 42 multiple choice questions, it's great. But if you don't do the short answer questions, that's going to hurt your grade. And the worst thing you could possibly do to not only yourself and your teacher is to write nothing or simply I don't know. If you write IDK, especially if you're my student, you're lucky I won't find you. Because if I do, I swear on this delicious Panera flatbread, will, no, something will happen. It will be bad. I don't know what, but it will be bad. So let's take a look. I'm going to share the screen again, and we're going to look at the short answer so we can break that down. Scroll down to the bottom. Okay, short answer. So in this example, it's going to be pretty easy. Another step-by-step -step process. Step one, read the question. Evaluate the lasting impact of the California gold rush as a positive or negative from the turning point for American society. Use one detail from the excerpts above to support your position. Okay, so we know that not only what this topic is about, it's about the California gold rush as a positive or negative. The 
question also states we have to use one detail from the excerpts above to support it. So one of our sentences is going to have to say that the California Gold Rush was a positive or negative because blank. Now, that's going to be outside information. You're going to have to say something about the California Gold Rush. You could say that there was you know, thousands of people that moved to California. You could say that people became rich. You could say that it gave people opportunity to work. You could say that was negative because it caused discrimination. You could say that people lost everything or that they split up from their families. And either or, you can pick one or the other. There's no right or wrong answer. But if you say something's positive, then you have to go through here and write another sentence about an example. So for instance, if you say that the gold rush was positive because a lot of people became rich and you say that certain people exchange their goods at enormous profits for the gold obtained from his Indian miners, there you go. If you say that it was bad because you know people were discriminated and you look at the Chinese and it says the Chinese found increasingly harsh treatments at the hands of their fellow miners, well then boom. Once again, the idea is if there's a passage or something, you have to actually use the passage. It's that Waldo. The test gives you a bunch of answers, and why not use the answers? It doesn't make sense if you don't use the answers. Good bread. Who knew? I have Panera bread. They'd have good bread. All right. So now that I'm done with the test taking strategies for multiple choice and the short answer, I want to go over something else. Just overall tips about taking the test. You have two hours, two whole hours to take a test. It's going to be super imperative for you guys to take that two, two hours seriously. 40 minutes, two minute break, 40 minutes, two minute break, 40 minutes. And some of you are going to be done in the first 40 minutes. I highly recommend that you do not turn that test in until you have checked all of your answers and that you know for a fact what you're doing. Because once you turn it in, that's it. And that's bad, because if you turn it in, and you can't change it, and you think of something, then you're out of luck, and your grade will suffer because of that. And we don't want that. We want you guys to do well. So what do you do? Well, you look over your answers. You circle your answer. You find that Waldo in each reading and you can definitively prove your answers. If you can't definitively prove your answer, and you guessed, then you're doing something wrong. On these finals, you should never guess on any problem, ever. That's the best part about reading passages. You don't actually have to know anything about the topic, really, if there's a reading passage, because the answer is going to be in the passage. Now, my kids have done really well with this lately, and I think that they're gonna do exceptionally well. Now, for the other kids that might not be mine, this is a good time for you to practice and maybe try to get some time to practice. Um, those finals are all available online to you. And if it's gonna take you to need to practice, that's totally fine. Now, another tip is that the night before, so for those of you that have to test tomorrow, um, go to bed early. Um, you should be in bed by nine o'clock. Get up um, around like seven, six thirty, seven o'clock, eat some breakfast, something with protein, eggs, bacon, peanut butter, Something that's going to get your brain stimulated in the morning so that it's not, you know, bum rushed on sugar. Sugar is kind of the opposite thing you want to avoid because with sugar, yeah, sugar is great. It's got energy, but it's false energy. You want to focus on that protein. Make sure you get some of that in your diet in the morning. Um, do remember that when you use your time efficiently, you have a better chance of doing well. That's not saying you should take forever on a problem, skip it, come back. But don't skip them all, obviously. If you find yourself more than five minutes on one question, that's not a short answer, it's time to move along. So, I think that we've covered all we need to cover in terms of pre-work, or pre-prep, which is good. What I want to do now is to kind of just go over basic topics. So I'll let you guys funnel some questions in, and I'll answer what you guys got until we don't have any more questions. There's 22 of you in here. Let's figure out what kind of, what kind of questions do we have. Go ahead and send me some questions. There should be a chat box. Um, if you click the link below, it'll take you to a video that you can ask questions to. You can click on that. 
If not, you can leave comments on the YouTube screen. Like if you just drop comments on there, you can tweet at me at the Mr. Galicchio, Mr. Underscore Galicchio, which should be which should be below. If it's not, I'm sorry. You can always go to Twitter. If my students, you can send me um, a remind chat. Um, and then others, you can send me um, an email at c o l i c c c at gcsnc dot com. I'm oh, surprised I haven't made anybody mad by just speaking randomly. It's pretty hilarious, actually. Mac and cheese is good. Very good. All right. Let me go ahead and check. Let's see. How many questions will be on the test? There's always that person. There's going to be 42 multiple choice, 42 um, multiple choice questions. Um, uh, nothing too hard. Um, so the multiple choice are really easy because they're all be really, like those are free response, or free response. they'll be written response. 42 multiple choice will all be primary sources and it'll be easy because you could just use that words Waldo to help you find the answer. Um, in terms of the short answer, you're going to be given two short answer questions, and um, it'll be pretty simple considering the fact that if you just use your outside knowledge and what they give you inside the test and for the yeah, passages, it'll be all good. <laughs> Got a question about the Barbary Wars. Um, that's an oddly specific question. Um, so the, the Barbary Wars... Um, I would be very surprised if they asked a question on this, but basically those were a series of wars between us and pirates that were kind of taking away our trade in North Africa, because Barbary is like North Africa, like Algeria area, Morocco, and they were kind of not letting us trade with them, and um, yeah, not good. So it really didn't divulge into too much. Um, all I know is that um, we, you know, there were a series of wars, and President Thomas Jefferson just didn't want to pay a ransom. He's not big on foreign ransoms, Jefferson. Once again, I'd be very, very surprised um, if they asked a question on that. It all ends in 1815 under Madison. That's all you really need to know. So that's all I need to know about the Barbary Wars. Um, I guess if you say that the major effect was that all pirate um, problems were uh, rele not relegated, uh, basically under the wing of Congress. Congress controls all relations with pirates, and still to this day. So pretty cool that the pirates, like the Somali pirates, if there's a problem with them, then that would be a thing that Congress would control our relations with pirates. Say so my friend. What else? What we got? What we got? What we got? What we got? Let's check remind. I got a question about pre-Columbian America. That's a good question. So, when it comes to pre-Columbian America, you have to remember, the Europeans, you know, they were not the first people there. Lots and lots and lots of Native Americans. Oh, people are very loud here. So, basically, with pre-Columbian America, there's a lot of different Native American tribes that live in North America and South America and Central America. We're going to focus on... Um, a group of Amer Native Americans that are really important called the Iroquois. And the Iroquois are six nations that live in New York under something called the Confederacy. Now, a lot of you think the Confederacy, you think of the Confederate States of America, and it's different government. A Confederacy is where you have different tribes. So, like, pretend your fingers are all different um, states, and they're all part of your hand, okay? 
your fingers all have a different relationship. Like your thumb is your gripping, your pointing finger is what you point, your middle finger is when you get really angry at somebody. Your ring finger is um, meant for the rings that when you get married and stuff, and of course your pinky, well, it's just there. So each finger has a different responsibility, right? But they're all part of your hand. So imagine a confederacy like a hand. It's all different, but still together as one, okay? People who are part of th the thumb know that they're the thumb and they're different than the pointer finger, but they're still together. So like if another hand were to attack this hand, then they would fight together, not separately. Now they might have problems with each other, but for the most part, they're still under the same hand. The names of those tribes you don't need to know. Um, just know that they were all part of the Iroquois. Another thing is that they had a stable government and a religion and a language. They didn't have a writing system, but they had all these major um, concepts of a society that Europeans, of course, didn't acknowledge because they were different than the Eurocentric uh, white dominated society that they had in Europe. For instance, there's a creator for uh, Native Americans. He's not, you know, bearded and white, so therefore he's automatically worse than God. And there was no king. There was like a chieftain who like ruled the Confederacy, but he had no power. There was no, you know, women had just as much responsibility as men in those Native American tribes. And, you know, God forbid women were equal to men under the Europeans. So um, the thought of that just was terrifying. So you saw these like differences between white settlers from Europe and Native Americans. And because of the differences, that's why they clash. Um, the Native Americans are the ones who help the settlers farm. They also have zero um, belief in private property. So when Europeans came to live there, they were like, yeah, absolutely. You can totally live here. It's everybody's land. And then the Europeans were like, cool. Well, now we own this land. And the Native Americans were like, what? You, you can't. That's not not a thing. You can't own land. And people were like, no, no, you, you can. We're going to do it. So mm. eventually the Native Americans would obviously be beaten back pretty hard. But you have to remember that the Iroquois are still around today, unlike a lot of other Native American tribes, which either assimilated into others or died off because of disease. A lot of disease. Um, and disease really gets into that thing called the Columbian Exchange, and they're actually, I would not I would not be surprised if there was a short answer question on the Columbian Exchange. You gotta remember, the Columbian Exchange is the exchange of goods and animals and foods, and diseases from Europe and Asia to North and South America. And everybody gave everybody something. Like, even in terms of diseases, we gave them smallpox and they gave us syphilis. Lovely. And, you know, we brought them horses. They gave us um, uh, potatoes. We gave them tomatoes. They gave us corn. There's a lot of cool things going on here. Um, a lot of foods and cultures and religions were exchanged and unfortunately forced upon people that didn't want to. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the Columbian Exchange was a huge part of that new world. Uh, crap. That's not what I wanted to do. Let's go back. We got another question. Marbury versus Madison. I will absolutely go over Marbury versus Madison. Um, in your opinion, are the tests we take in class easier than the final? <laughs> It's tough to say because honestly, my tests are somewhat like they're like old, old release tests at times. So sometimes they're easier, sometimes they're harder. If I make a test, it's probably harder. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to over prepare you. Um, Marbury versus Madison. That's a good question. That'll probably be on there. Well, if you want to get the question right, no matter what with Marbury versus Madison, just look for the words judicial review. Sorry, it's like really loud up here. People just are super loud. Anyways, Marbury versus Madison, judicial review. Marbury versus Madison, judicial review. 
Marbury versus Madison, judicial review. Now, what the heck is judicial review? That's a great question. Judicial review is the ability of the Supreme Court to deem laws unconstitutional or constitutional. So for instance, if there was a law passed in North Carolina, for instance, that said that I cannot eat Panera Bread because I am a man, I would go to the Supreme Court and be like, this law is unconstitutional because it's breaking my civil rights. It's not treating me equally. I should be allowed to eat Panera Bread despite me being a man Okay, I shouldn't, you know, not be allowed to eat because I'm a man. That would be silly for them to like make a law banning people from doing stuff, right? That would never happen here in North Carolina. Anyways, gotta know that buzzword: Marbury versus Madison. Judicial review. Man, I look like a derp in that picture. That's great. Can I explain the fifty-four forty or fight situation? Absolutely. So, when we were expanding that thing called Manifest Destiny, that idea we had about getting bigger, there was this president called James K. Polk. And Polk was a pretty interesting guy. He, uh, he thought that we should just go take land that didn't belong to us and fight people for it. First people were Texas, you know, we wanted to, he wanted to take Texas from Mexico. Texas had just recently got their independence from Mexico. Mexico didn't recognize it and said, you're still part of us. Texas wanted to annex it and all the other presidents before him were like, nah, from like Jackson all the way to Polk. They were like, nah, don't want to involve ourselves. Polk was like, nah, we're going to go to war and we're going to look for every reason. And they, you know, a couple Texans got shot, or American soldiers got shot on the Texas America, uh, Mexico border, started the Mexican American War. 5440 or fight, however, has nothing to do with Texas. It has everything to do with the Oregon Territory, the Northwest Territory of Oregon. And the cool thing about 5440 or fight is that it's a latitude point. It's a latitude point like halfway between Seattle and Alaska. So it's like in modern day Canada. And Polk was like, yeah, we're going to fight over that land. That's not our land today. I'll show you a map of what I mean. Let's see. Okay. So, as you can see, here's... United States, right here. So the British had land here. What we wanted to do was to get all the land up here. We ended up getting here, which is modern day. This is Vancouver Island, so the city of Vancouver is like right here. Uh, I believe it's like right here. And so what happened is, 5440 or fight was we wanted to get into... Um, we wanted to get into another war. Like, Polk was willing to get into another war with Great Britain if we weren't allowed that 54th parallel. Now, that would have been the third war against Great Britain in the last 75 years. We won one, we drew the other, and honestly, who knows what would happen in that war. But all we know is we didn't fight. We did a, um, a treaty with them. And we gave them the full, you know, we, we compromised at the 49th parallel. And for a lot of people, people saw that as a loss because, you know, Polk promised us the 54th parallel. And God forbid a politician ever promises something and not make good on it. I think I've heard that before. I can't be too sure, though. I don't think that's ever happened that a politician would ever lie to us. Hmm. Let's take a look. So that's all you need to know about 5440 or fight. We have a new question. Are there any questions that do not have a paragraph on the final? Um, not sure what you mean by that. You mean like a reading response? Probably, maybe there's one or two, but I doubt it. They're probably all going to be reading-based questions. They always are. You'll probably be given like maps, excuse me, or a chart, or a graph. 
or something, or table, you're going to be given something that you have to read and prove the answer. I don't think everything's going to be a paragraph, so don't quote me on that. But I would be very surprised if they did not. I'd be very, very surprised. So, not just me. Let's check the tweet box. I gotta log into the Panera Wi Fi on my phone. Still 22 of you, huh? Dope. What court cases do we need to know and can I explain them? Okay. That's a good question. All right. So, we talked about Marbury versus Madison, the judicial review. I guess it wouldn't hurt to know um, McCullough in Maryland, which is um, the states regulate trade uh, between, or excuse me, Congress regulates trade between the states. McCullough versus Maryland, it's all about, um, wow, no, that's wrong. That's Gibbons. Nogden, don't erase what I just said. Just skip over. McCullough versus Maryland is that the federal government cannot be taxed by the um, uh, excuse me, the federal government can't be taxed by the states. Um, they wanted to tax the bank, the National Bank of the United States in Maryland, and the federal government was like, ha ha, sucker, you can't do that. That's like kids trying to tax their parents. That's, that's not going to happen. Gibbons versus Ogden, now that is interstate uh, trade that's regulated by Congress. The Dred Scott decision, you got to know that one. You know, slaves aren't people, they're property. Property can't uh, be uh, can't sue. It's like, I'm sitting on a chair. This is the property of Panera. I, if I sit on it too hard, you know, the chair isn't going to, uh, you know, sue me or Panera. Like, Panera can sue me for breaking their stuff, but the chair itself, and that was its reasoning, was that um, property can't sue, and since save, slaves weren't technical citizens, they had no business suing. Um, Worcester versus George is huge because uh, the Supreme Court found that the, the uh, Cherokee um, could stay on their land, and unfortunately for them, they still got kicked off by Andrew Jackson, which is hilarious. Not hilarious that they got kicked off, but like hilarious that Andrew Jackson kicks all these Native Americans off their land. And the people are mad that he's not going to be on the $20 bill anymore. Huh. Why did I forgot that like he like is responsible for like thousands of people dying? Hmm. Another one? Ooh, arugula. Ooh, ah, why is it on this? Anyways, um, the next one is Plessy versus Ferguson, the old separate but equal case. Um, you know, you could have that made all Jim Crow laws uh, totally okay, making the United States, uh, you know, not a great place to live if you were black. Uh, they had all the whites only places, and, you know, you could only do certain things and go certain places at certain times if you were black. And, so those are the four, or the more that you need to do. Marbury versus Madison. McCullough, Maryland, which is, once again, bank, uh, about the bank. You can't have the federal government get sued by the states. Gibbons and Ogden, interstate travel or trade must be regulated by Congress, not the states. Uh, Worcester versus Georgia, removal of the Native Americans was unjust, yet uh, the Supreme Court can't force people to do something. That's the president. Uh, Dred Scott decision, slaves can't uh, sue in court of law. Um, and then finally, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Okay. Barbecue chicken flatbread. Not terrible. I should have just gotten more mac and cheese. It was so good. Seriously, how do you people like Panera? It's not that great. It's super overpriced. This was all $10. If I went to Chipotle, I'd be living the dream right now for $10. Can I explain the difference between Puritans, Separatists, and Pilgrims? Absolutely, I can. Separatists. Pilgrims and Puritans are two separate group of Separatists. Separatists are people who want to be separate from the Church of England. So um, the Church of England at the time um, was Catholic. King James was Catholic. King Charles was Catholic. King Charles II was Catholic. And King James II was Catholic. So anybody who left the English country to flee from England because they were separatists were Protestant. Those Protestants 
were two groups of people, well, a lot of groups of people. Um, two of the major ones that went to New England were pilgrims who went on the Mayflower, who founded Plymouth Colony, who most of them died in the first winter. And then the Puritans with John Winthrop, the uh, Colony on a Hill speech, and um, founded Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it was not a great place to be a witch, if you know what I mean. So eventually, Pilgrims and Puritans, they're the ones who, you know, Pilgrims, Plymouth, Puritans, Massachusetts Bay, William Bradford, John Winthrop. I know that that's hard, and I doubt that they would ask you such a specific question. If you just remember that both of them were fleeing religious freedom, that's pretty much all you need to know. Religious freedom for both of them. But my favorite thing about Puritans and Pilgrims is that like they are like the super most hateful people ever. Like they fled because of religious freedom and then they were so not religiously tolerant. They like like kicked so many people out. Like Roger Williams, who founded Rhode Island based on religious freedom, which is still like the most religiously well tolerant place in terms of everything today. Yeah. Woo! New England. Two new messages. Okay. Battle strategies of the North and South. I'm guessing you mean the Civil War. <laughs> I doubt that this would be an actual question on the test, but I'll, I'll, I'll entertain the question. So the North invade the South during the Civil War. Super hard to invade somebody uh, when they have the tactical advantage. And that's why the North got its butt kicked for a lot of the early battles of the Civil War, until Lee went to the North. And by invading the North, he broke his own rule and therefore got his own butt kicked, especially in battles like Antietam and in Gettysburg. It just did not bode well for him each time he invaded. The South, retreat. South, retreat. Um, North, just throw as many people as they possibly can at a, at a, at a battle. They could not care less about how many people died, which is kind of sad if you think about it because thousands and thousands of people died and people like Grant were just like letting them die. No regard for human life. I guess that's where that phrase, uh, no regard for human life came. So Ron James can thank Ulysses S. Grant for that dunk call. I really don't like arugula. I don't know why I got this. Ugh. But just the aftertaste, honestly. Let's see. Don't see any new questions on that. Let me find what we got here. None on the tweet box. Let's go to the remind. Let's see, no. Can I please explain? Oh, I already explained that. I love how somebody randomly got my, I love how a non-student of mine got my remind. That's genius, whoever, whoever gave him that. Congrats on that. Let's see if we got any new activity on the video. Uh, uh, uh. Still waiting. You guys are killing me right now, making me wait. I'm eating a half a salad. It doesn't really matter where it is. <laughs> so, do you know, is Sean staying in the apartment while in the, whatever, your, your friend's house? Okay, here's the help. Odd conversations to have while people are... Oh my God, it looks great on you. Yes. Ah, people are so loud. Oh my God. All right. Here we go. Some of the main treaties. Okay, that's probably a good question to ask. Okay. Treaties. There are a lot of Treaty of Paris's. Uh, the two that you need to know, Treaty of Paris I and the French and Indian War. 
Uh, Britain got all land uh, east of the app, excuse me, east of the Mississippi, uh, and they had most of Canada. All the French that were living in those areas went to New Orleans because they still had the land out west. Uh, but they'd eventually take it from the Spanish, technically. It was the Spanish, and that would then surely come the French. The next Treaty of Paris was the one that ended the um, American Revolution in 1783, which was um, a couple years after the last fighting that we did. Um, excuse me. And for that Treaty of Paris, which is 1783, that one was a little bit different because what it did was it made the United States its own nation, and it also made Britain um, give up all of its military bases, which they didn't do and was totally a cause of the War of 1812. So, whoops. Then you have the Treaty of Ghent, G-H-E-N-T. Slaters are so loud. Holy crap. Um... Anyways, the Treaty of Ghent, that actually ends the War of 1812. And that's kind of important, I guess, because basically it ended the war as a draw and nothing really got resolved and we fought the British over nothing. Uh, before that would be Jay's Treaty in 1789, which causes a quasi-war with France because they get all butthurt that we're just trying to be neutral with people. And... They're not really happy about that, so um, that's another one. Um, which one do you want me to talk about? The webster ashburton Treaty. We must be in Fox class <laughs> because we did not talk about that, but that's okay. Um, that's just a border dispute between the United States and Britain about Maine and New Brunswick. Um, so, like, if you look at Maine uh, and where it's oddly located there's something called new brunswick towards the north east of that in like nova scotia basically we drew a line saying this is where we we end and you begin <laughs> wow must be really funny <laughs> really funny i must have missed the joke I'm really upset i missed this joke I wish I was that funny. I've never heard anybody laugh about that anything like that ever. So that's basically the main treaties. Um, I don't think you really have to. I guess I'll go through, see if there's any others that you need to know. Ooh, this one looks like a good one. Important American history treaties. Oh, yeah, Pinckney's Treaty. You need to know that because that's how we got, um, excuse me, we kind of got free land south in the Mississippi between the U.S. and Spain. Um, you could technically say the Louisiana Purchase is a treaty, I guess, but we totally bought that from the French, so it's not really a treaty. Uh, the adams onus Treaty is super important. We Spain gave Florida to the United States in 1819. Uh, the Oregon Treaty, that was that whole 54-40 year fight where they drew the line um, at the 54th parallel, or excuse me, at the 49th parallel instead of the 54th parallel. Um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was super important because it ended the Mexican-American War, and it gave us a crap load of land um, out west, including California, Nevada, uh, Utah, Colorado, um, parts of Arizona and New Mexico, except this little sliver of land which we eventually would buy from Mexico again called the Gadsden Purchase. So, that's all the major treaties that you need to know. I well, hope that helps. Day 14 already. All right. Let's go back to the Gmail. More comments. Any questions how women took place in the Civil War? Oh, God. You know what? I'm sure you'd wrap, before you get that question, I think you'd really need to focus on women's, uh, women throughout 
American history and like how it's changed. Talk about people like Abigail Adams, who you know pushed for women's suffrage um, immediately following the American Revolution. You could talk about the Seneca Falls Convention with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucretia Mott. You could talk about Sojourner Truth. You can talk about her "Ain't I a Woman" speech. You could talk about any of those speeches and any of those period of times. I mean, the Civil War was yeah, it was some super important time for women, but like. I would say more about the 1848 Seneca Convention would be more of a topic you'd want to actually focus on rather than just that in general. If I were to put my finger on something, I would say it would be that. Um, but still probably super important in general um, in, in that nutshell. Um, in terms of that... Uh, let's see. lightly ask those ladies to move because I have manners. North and air. Okay. So I got a question about the stamp acts and the intolerable acts. And yeah, so basically all those things that led up to the Civil War. American Revolution, not Civil War. So after the French and Indian War, Britain was in a crap load of debt. And so what happened is they needed to pay it back, so they thought that they would start taxing the colonies. Now, if you were to suddenly tax somebody without telling them you could tell you could probably understand how that would go uh not well um and uh so basically for the most part these people were not very recipient to these tax so you have a super serious amount of taxes number one being the stamp act anything with a printed legal document so let's talk about newspapers uh licenses um any sort of um, stamps themselves, like being like something that's stamped onto a paper. Any of those papers were taxed and people were mad, so they boycotted. Um, there was a uh, Townsend Act, which uh, the Townsend Act, they basically taxed all foreign goods for houses, so that made those foreign goods that were cheaper, more expensive, making them buy British goods. And so with the British goods being more expensive, the Britain, British government would make a profit and of course the uh, people would have to pay more and they don't like that, so they get mad. You then get into the Proclamation Act, which says that colonists cannot extend past the Appalachian Mountains. And for people like that, they're upset because they want to move out, but Britain wants to maintain those positive relations with Native Americans um, who they're trading with and so they stop the colonists from going. Um, they also pass uh, the Tea Act, which um, it raises the cost of foreign tea, making, once again, Americans feel economically restricted, having to only buy British tea because it's cheaper, um, instead of like French tea, for instance. And what happens there is that they have the Boston Tea Party and people dump a lot of tea, and then Britain sends in the intolerable acts and the intolerable acts they you know blockade boston they shut down communication they they follow with the writs of assistance the fact that britain can come in and you know seize property and uh they can seize property without a warrant you have the quartering act you got soldiers living in the houses of the soldiers it's not a good situation there's a lot of problems going on with the um with the with the british government now what you could argue is that sure that's just a government making the necessary changes that it needs to to raise money. But unfortunately, there's this thing called salutary neglect, which was 
the American colonies all the way up to 1763, which let the colonies rule themselves. And all of a sudden, Britain started taxing them. And so, of course, they're going to be upset about it. That's pretty much where it comes down to for that sort of fact. So that's all the that. Describe triangle of trade. Go Donald Trump. Oh, Dawson. Oh, you poor, ignorant person. All right. Here we go. Triangle trade's easy. Let me just show you. Triangular trade. Okay. Let's view this image. So, can we make this bigger? Uh, of course, it's freaking tiny. Get a large version of it. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So, what we're going to look at here is a map of triangular trade. There we go. So, as you can see, triangular trade is thusly a series of trade that went in a triangular fashion. It starts out in Africa. What happens is Europeans come to Africa, they meet a bunch of tribesmen and go, hey, I want you to capture local people and turn them into slaves, and I want you to turn those slaves into us. We will give you guns for them. The chieftains go, oh, goody, here, take these people. And those people go to the West Indies where they work on plantations. On those plantations, they work on sugar plantations and tobacco plantations in North America. They work on indigo plantations. They work on co uh, cotton plantations. And what happens is they take all of those resources and we send those natural, or excuse me, those raw materials, which you turn natural resources into raw materials, and you sell those raw materials back to your mother country, aka England, who can then turn them into final products. And guess what? Sell it back to Africa for slaves to work in, on those farms, to turn them into raw materials, to go back to England, and there you go. Now, you will notice that some of them do go back to North America because, of course, you have to sell them to the colonists who made them. So, yes, isn't that lovely? Triangular trade. It's like a Ponzi scheme. Actually, it probably would be defined as a Ponzi scheme if it was in today's world. But, yeah. Super not popular. People did not like that. What do we got here? Are we all out of questions, guys? Am I, have I been that good? I know my students. I've been preparing the crap out of you guys, so you guys are probably way more prepared than any other class. Just saying. Let's see. I don't see a lot of questions being asked, guys. Should this be where I say my adieu and I can drive back to Greensboro and enjoy the rest of my night? No? Apparently not. All right. I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes. Think about your questions. Think about what you need. Think about what you might not know. Think about you know, what you think. Short answer question or any question on the... There will definitely be a short answer question. There will be two short answer questions. Dose. Uh, what they're about, who knows, man. I do not know. And if I knew, I couldn't tell you anyways. Um, Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, civil rights... I think it's not going to be on there, but I would say maybe there could be a question about, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Those are super important um, periods in time. Reconstruction is totally 
covered by American One. So I think that that could de definitely be a question, uh, a short answer question. Maybe, you know, looking at a 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and maybe the challenges to that. You can talk about uh, the 13th Amendment, which is abolition of slavery, and then you can talk about how they went right to sharecropping. Or you can talk about the 14th Amendment, which was like everybody's treated equal, and then you talk about Jim Crow. Or then you talk about 15th Amendment, which is all about voting, and then you talk about literacy tests or grandfather clauses or um, poll taxes. Those are all challenges to those guaranteed rights that they were given in the, um, in the Constitution. So I wouldn't say, you know, there would be a question. I'm going to say there will be something on the Emancipation Proclamation. They freaking love the Emancipation Proclamation on those tests. All you have to remember is that it freed the slaves in the, in the South. It did not free the slaves in the North. It didn't free the slaves in the border states. It only freed the slaves in Confederate states, states in rebellion. The Confederacy. You guys are killing me. Come on. Ask me some questiones. Mm hmm. <laughs> Scrolling through, checking all the sources and stuff. You guys are up there. We go. Well, well, we have to answer passages info with the short answer questions, like the multiple choices. Yes, yes. They won't ask you. In my opinion, they will not ask you a short answer question without giving you a passage to read from. If they do, use the test that you are already given. Can I go over all the compromises? Absolutely. Missouri Compromise literally divides the country north and south at the 36th parallel. So Missouri and below are southern slave states. Everything above that is uh, northern free states. When Missouri was added as a slave state, Maine was added as a free state. It keeps that nice little balance of the slave and free states. Then you have the Compromise of 1850. And the Compromise of 1850 admits California as a free state and Texas as a slave state. Once again, maintaining that balance between the slaves and the free states. They also extend the Fugitive Slave Law, which is horrible, and it is pretty bad. It also allows for popular sovereignty. So any territorial voting, uh, for instance, um, Kansas, Nebraska territory wanted to vote on slavery, and they do. And unfortunately for them, uh, there's a lot of bloodshed and violence in the ble bleeding Kansas John Brown thing in 1854. Um, so that's you know what you need to go. Can I go over the first colonies, Roanoke and Jamestown? Sure. Roanoke, New North Carolina, the Outer Banks, Croatoan. Basically what happened was their governor left and their people assimilated with the Croatoan people and disappeared until literally this year. Uh, we, they, DNA testing found that they had uh, assimilated with the uh, Native American people. So that scared the crap out of people and nobody ever wanted to come back to the New World until uh, John Smith and the Jamestown Charter was brought here under, um, and they claim the area is Virginia, um, under King James's cousin, uh, the Virgin uh, Queen um, Elizabeth, and they found a Jamestown in 1607, and that was almost a failure as well, but thankfully for the tobacco crop that John Rolfe brought, it started to bloom, and, you know, it became an illustrious uh, tobacco uh, colony, and still is today. Um, then you have Plymouth, and that was founded by the Pilgrims in 1620. Uh, they leave for religious persecution reasons in England. They get there, and most of them die in the first winter. They only survive because the Native Americans are, like, super nice and teach them how to farm. And then, yeah, there you go. Can I go over the territories and all of their significance? The only thing in terms of territories and their significance, quote-unquote, would be the Northwest Territory, and I'm talking about the original Northwest Territory and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And so, once again, Northwest Ordinance, 1787, we're talking um, creation of five new states, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Illinois, those five. And those five states basically become states, and they become free states, meaning there's no slaves there. And that's huge because that's the first time where we ban slavery somewhere. 
And that's all done under the Articles of Confederation government, which I'm surprised nobody has even asked me about the Articles of Confederation, but that's probably because you guys know it. I know my kids know all about the Articles of Confederation. Um, about you know, Mr. Buck's kids, uh, I don't know, a little sketchy. 8.30, can I go home yet? No, still here? All right, here with my Sam I Am Susical t-shirt. Look at this thing, it's awesome. How cool am I? Right? Freaking awesome. So. Still waiting. Oh, there we go. New comment. Why did early settlement struggles such as Jamestown? Climate. Climate. Like right now, how it's muggy and hot. People in England don't like that. Um, disease. Um, mosquitoes. Not really a thing in England. Like, I've never been bitten by a mosquito in England, and, and I've been there a lot. Um, there was also just crappy, swampy areas. Um, they were not very um, used to swampy land and to farming in that. You had to learn how to farm in the swamp. And in New England, you couldn't farm because the soil was so bad. You had to learn how to farm in the sand which is super hard because you need to use fish as fertilizer and that's where the Native Americans came in. Should this be easy? I'm from a different class. <laughs> it's going to be very easy. You're probably very prepared. Um, don't overthink it. Can I explain the Articles of Confederation? See, I inspired your thinking. Okay, first government, uh, the Articles of Confederation, 1776 to uh, 1789, 13 years of hell. Um, I only say that not to offend anyone, but just because it was so bad. Um, like the government sucked. Like people complain about the government sucking now. They have no idea how bad it was. Um, and during the Articles of Confederation. You remember the Confederacy and I talked about the hand and how each finger had its own responsibility? Well, let's just pretend that your hand had like an infection on your thumb. And the only way that the thumb was going to be saved is if these other four fingers helped it. But these four fingers only looked out for themselves, so they didn't help out the thumb. That's the Articles of Confederation, and that's why Confederacy is never going to work out. The Confederacy is dumb because they don't work together. They work separately, but are associated together. Confederation, Articles of Confederation gave all the power to the states, not the federal government. So you had 13 governments instead of one government. There was no president. There was one legislative body that made laws. You had to get all, um, you had to get nine out of 13 uh which killed a mosquito. You had to get nine out of 13 uh, states to agree to pass a law. If you wanted to change the Articles of Confederation, you had to get all 13 states to agree, which was stupid. Uh, big states like Virginia and Pennsylvania and New York didn't feel as represented because they had more people um, than, say, Delaware or Rhode Island. It was just a cluster of bad problems. And basically what happens, they also couldn't collect taxes. And the worst part about this was because they couldn't collect taxes, they couldn't enforce anything either because they didn't have a military. Each state had its own militia force, but they didn't have a, a national army. We didn't have a, a federally regulated army. So if anybody had attacked us during that period of time, we'd have to have like 13 different militias try to do something. You think people from Georgia are going to help out people from Massachusetts? There's no way. People today in Massachusetts wouldn't help out people from Georgia and vice versa. Basically, this is all a huge problem, and it all gets solved during the article or um, during the Constitutional Convention in 1787, in which the Constitution is drafted primarily by James Madison, uh, but there's a couple other people. And James Madison and Alexander Hamilton basically write these things called the Federalist Papers, talk about how the federal government needs to be stronger than the state governments, and it is. Um, still to this day, the Supremacy Clause, the federal government now has three branches instead of one. We have the legislative who makes the laws, the ju um, judicial who interprets the laws, and the executive branch who enforces the laws. You have Congress in the, as the head of the legislative branch, the Supreme Court head of the judicial branch, and finally the president who's the head of the executive branch. Wow, that was a lot. Important presidents. Oh man, that's. Oh. It's tough to go over the presidents because there's there there was a lot of them. Um, what president would I compare Trump to? I wouldn't compare him to anything because he's not a president and he will never be president. So I refuse to answer that question until he is president. Um, to answer the question about which about presidents, um. 
obviously George Washington, neutrality. Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase. Um, Madison got us through War of 1812. Monroe, Monroe Doctrine, so told Europe to stay out of uh, um, us, uh, out of the Northern Hemisphere. Andrew Jackson, Indian Removal Act, Panic of 1837, bank crisis shot down the bank. Um, the nullification crisis where South Carolina almost seceded from the Union again. Um, Polk, 5440 or fight. You could talk about Lincoln and the Civil War crisis, obviously. Um, those would be the major ones. Um, I'm not going to repeat that, so just rewind me if you need to. All right. I'm getting chat out here by mosquitoes. I just got, took a big bite to my knee, and it hurts. So I'm going to end with this question about Reconstruction. Reconstruction were was an aim to not only rebuild the South after the devastation of the Civil War, but it was also an attempt to improve the lives of former slaves, those people called freedmen, because they had been freed by um, the 13th Amendment, and they were all without jobs. So there was a lot of efforts to help them, whether it's the Freedmen's Bureau, giving them food, giving them um, job opportunities, giving them education, whether it was the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, giving them the right to not be slaves, to the right to citizenship, and the right to vote. It was all ways of bettering themselves. Um, Reconstruction sounded really good, but white people weren't really ready for it to take effect, so they did this thing called, you know, rise up against it, and they tried to fight it with the Ku Klux Klan, um, and also Southern Democrats who were just not really willing to watch um, black people become you know, to meet their potential. Um, they really fought it both physically and in legislate, uh, through legislation. Um, and eventually they were able to conspire a deal because the only way that these laws were actually getting passed and to protect the freedmen was that the military was being um, told to protect African Americans. Well, in 1877, when uh, Rutherford B. Hayes is made president, uh, elected president, even though he wasn't even popular vote or electoral vote, he uh, he was he was given the presidency, and what happened was they uh, pulled all the troops out of the South, and that's when everything went really bad in the South. Um, people started to kill African Americans. People started to um, make them it make it very very hard for them to live. And people would argue that Reconstruction itself was almost as bad as slavery was because at slavery they were seen as valuable because they were property, but when they weren't property, they were just, there was nothing. There were laws passed that say you couldn't, you know, the Jim Crow laws, you couldn't eat at the same establishments, you couldn't, um, you couldn't walk on the same side of the street, you could definitely not um, have a relationship with um, mixed genders and mixed races. And at that time, that was just a really bad time to live. All right, I'm ending it. That's it. I'm done. If you guys have any other questions, I will be at school tomorrow at 8 o'clock. If you need some questions answered, you're more than welcome to come in and ask. But other than that, it's been a real pleasure, guys. Thank you for watching me for the last hour and eight minutes. Uh, watch the video as many times as you need to. I wish you all luck, and it's been a pleasure teaching at Northern Guilford High School. And I'm glad I've got to know each and every one of you um, as, well as, uh, as well as I have. Um, so wish you good night. Get some sleep. Eat some breakfast. Be awesome.